Um, so we'll carry on talking today about uh, flow of multiple fluids. Um, I'll try and go back through some of the things we talked about last time uh, in terms of recap, and then we'll talk in terms of these things. If we know something about permeabilities, we'll talk about permeability not in porous media but in fractures. Um, we'll link permeabilities to the capillary pressure saturation diagrams. You'll remember that we have this leveret um, J factor, which gives a very specific magnitude for the bubbling pressure, which is related to permeability. So we'll see if we can relate it to that very quickly. And then we'll talk about flow in porous media uh, beyond Darcy's law, but using continuity equations, just like we talked about in 303. So that's kind of uh, our pathway for today. Um, so, um, what to do? I'm going to start with this. So, I don't think I did a great job yesterday, uh, Tuesday, explaining this. So, I'll spend a bit of time going back through. Th well, I would, I would cover it anyway for the second time. But it's an important concept. Um, and I suppose. The main uh, takeaways were that we could get flow of two fluids. We had one fluid which was, let's call a wetting fluid, and let's do them different colors. One fluid which was a, a non-wetting fluid, uh, and we could have flow volume of each of those. Yeah, that's not too bad. Looks thin here, but... And uh, basically what we said was that if you want to calculate that volumetric flow rate of that fluid, you can calculate it as a function of the total cross-sectional area. So the total cross-sectional area A is equal to AW, we never def which scale with the saturations. And going back to this, it, what was it? It was a relative permeability and it was a permeability divided by viscosity, and it was a, a pressure drop over length, Darcy's law. So this is dx, or dl, whatever you want to call it. This was dp, occurring along that length. And we could write this for the wetting fluid. This would be the relative permeability of the wetting fluid and the viscosity of the wetting fluid and the pressure of that. Or we could write it conversely for the opposite. So this would be non-wetting. Total. Th these are the total areas of the system, right? So let me do those as black. This is the same area. Maybe you could call it area total, just to be clear. And the relative permeability of the non-wetting fluid, the permeability of the porous medium, the viscosity of the non-wetting fluid, and the pressure gradient of the non-wetting fluid, TPDX. So that, that's what came out of last time. And so we just need to be aware of that. So if you want to calculate the individual components of the, the two fluids, we can get them from these two equations. This A is the total area of the end of the core, not the divided up areas. Uh, we talked about dividing it up uh, so that these areas that were filled with the different fluids were proportional to the saturations. We know that the saturation of the let me do it 
the saturation of the non-wedding plus saturation of the wedding fluids equals one. They add up to one because they completely fill all the pore space which is there. And uh, we know roughly that these two gradients, although they're slightly displaced, because uh, we drew this last time as well, was that we might want to think that the pressure gradient for the, the other fluid um, I'm running out of space at the top, but the the upstream jump from this is DP non-wetting, and the other one is wetting. And so even though the magnitudes of the pressures, because they're in two different phases, aren't the same at the same location, one is bigger than the other, the gradient of them are roughly the same as you go downstream. So these two terms here are roughly equivalent to each other. And so all it comes to do that, if we know what these pressure gradients are, if we know what the viscosities of the two fluids are, we know what the permeability of the core is. So K equals permeability. And it's the same. It's, a, it's one, one magnitude. And so everywhere in the core, the permeability is the same. Uh, has different fluids flowing in it, but the permeability in the core is the same because it's defined in terms of this strange unit of meters squared, and there's, so, there's no information in there that says anything about the fluid that's flowing. It's just a function of the geometry. And we said last time that this meter squared is kind of the pore diameter squared roughly equals the permeability. We can think of it that way. So to be able to solve for these uh, volumetric flow rates, we just need to figure out exactly where we are on this curve. So if we are at a saturation, let's just choose a saturation. So this would be at a wetting saturation of Yeah, wetting saturation of, I don't know, what is that? That's 70%? Uh, and this is at a non-wetting saturation, by definition, of 30%. It's written in percentages here, but you can think of it as a decimal, so they add to one. Um, and then we need to think about exactly what the magnitudes of the relative permeabilities would be. And so the relative permeabilities for the wetting saturation, if I do a bigger, oh, I can use this, can't I? Don't have the right colors. How do I get the right color? And this will have to do for the other one. Oops. So um, non-wetting in green and wetting in red. So we're keeping that with that as I move through this. So the relative permeability of the wetting fluid would be this. And so this is, so we know that the relative permeabilities are greater than zero and less than one, just from this scale here. And so the relative permeability of the wetting fluid would be, I don't know, what's this? Is it a quarter? This is a half. This is 0.2, I'm guessing. The relative permeability of the non-wetting fluid would be this. And this is 0 0.05, I guess. Used to work with a driller. He used to take vodka on the drill rig in his flask. Is that what you have there? <laughs> 
Yeah, good. Bruce. Good. <laughs> and so now, if you, uh, if the wetting fluid is water, and you know what the permeability is, then you know this. You know the viscosity. Why didn't I do it? What's the viscosity? Uh, so you know the permeability from this. You know the relative permeability from this. The viscosity of the wetting fluid, is, if it's water at 20 centigrade, is of the order of 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds. And you know the air is flowing across, so you could calculate that. If you wanted to know uh, the Darcy, well, it doesn't matter, we don't need to know that. So that's it. So that's hopefully setting straight the things that I might have garbled yesterday, uh, Tuesday, by talking about wetting fluid, the red fluid, and fluid one uh, interchangeably when, <laughs> when one term would do, yes. This one? Uh, so like in the equation up there, we have like a relative permeability of the wetting. Ooh, this one? Uh, no, sorry, it's like on the top. It's like, yeah, right there. Yeah. We have like a relative permeability of the wetting, and then we have like a total permeability. Mm -hmm. Does that uh, total permeability be addition of the two relative no. permeability? No, it's the permeability of the porous medium. So if you take a core, and you flow water through it, uh, just one fluid, you'll get uh, permeability being equal to, it's, it's just a single permeability, so it'll be cross-sectional area, the permeability divided by the viscosity times the pressure gradient. This is the permeability that you get out of this for a single fluid. If you flow gas in this core, You'd also, so it's 100% saturated with gas, then again, you'd get the flow rate out of this would be the air of the core times the permeability times the viscosity and the pressure gradient. But now the only difference would be that this would be the viscosity of the gas versus the viscosity of the water. And so the permeability of a core is a single value. It doesn't matter what the fluid is. So. Uh, the relative permeability talks about the relative scaling of the areas, and I suppose this other term defines how well that flows in it. So that's, that's an important point. So the other thing is that if you're adding permeabilities, the point of this is that it's kind of blurry, but this is K relative of the wetting fluid plus the non-wetting fluid. The point is if you take this height here to here, I can remove that. And then if you take this height here and add them together, you get this magnitude here. So this curve is just a summation of these two, the red height and the green height, if you like. And it's just making the point that actually you think that if you're completely filling this cross section, the overall permeability to the system would be one, right? They'd add together and they'd be equal to this magnitude up here. But that's not true. Uh, if you add them together, it's less than that. Uh, the only relevant feature about this is that this relative permeability here at irreducible saturation is higher than this one here. And that was what we explained last time. Remember we looked at these figures with the bead packs with the little finger of the red fluid going beyond it. And this is the non-wetting permeability. And the non-wetting permeability preferentially fills the big voids. And the big voids will be more permeable, and so the relative permeability will be larger at irreducible saturation than it is for water. So that's the reason for that. Uh, and ultimately these must go through the individual um, non-wetting and wetting permeabilities, they must go through 100% here, right? When it's 100% um, water saturated, uh, to be able to use this equation here, the relative permeability would be 1 times the permeability of the system times the viscosity of water, which would give you exactly this. 
should do that red, I suppose. It doesn't react very quickly or I can't get the thing. I'm trying to just underscore this. So if it's 100% saturated with water, which would be here, right? This, this 100 percent water saturated. You'd expect that the relative permeability would be one. Substituting the relative permeability on one would give you this exactly. This is our total cross-sectional area. AT. So, so this is just a summary. That this is pretty much all you need for this class is to be able to understand this this diagram. So hopefully the some um, logic is restored from what we talked about the other day. Um, you'd imagine that since the capri pressure versus saturation curves are hysteretic, right? You p put a bubble of fluid in it, it goes up. When you reduce the capri pressure, it comes down on a different trajectory. You'd expect that the relative permeability curves also have this hysteresis in them as they, as they change saturations, and they do. Um, it's kind of a moot point because you never know these curves very well. In fact, we talked last time about the fact that it might be sufficient if you know the curves well enough. Let me do it the other way around. In this kind of X plot, to look like this. Uh, and this X plot to look like this. So it's great that you can have this hysteretic behavior, but almost never you know that information well enough to be able to use it. And so the fact that these curves vary something like this x, that they're excluded from these regions because this, these are irre irreducible saturations. This is including um, uh, the water that you can't get removed from it when you resaturate with water. And this is the amount of NAPL that's left in it that you can't get out of it because it's clung in the system. You can't get into these kind of no-go areas and so defining the relative permeability outside those doesn't really make so much sense. So, so they are hysteretic, but perhaps we won't worry too much about that. You can imagine they're different for different materials. Uh, let's not care about that either. Um, so, so we know probably enough about this to describe the behavior for our system. So this is a key understanding of what we'd like to do. We also notice that um, when we push fluids into the subsurface, if you have fractures in it, that is one preferential route that the fluids might take in saturating it. So we might also think that when we're looking at the motion of fluids in fractured media, then that might be an important feature for flow in the fractured system. So we could also talk about permeability of fractures. And so one way to look at that would be to, uh, to do this. And so this is the, the idea. So if you remember back to 303-ish, I'm not sure whether we uh, talked about it specifically when we talked in your year, but if you remember uh, thinking of flowing between two parallel fractures, imagine two plates, or through two plates rather, not two, through two fractures. Imagine if you flow fluid through that system. Try and push fluid through here, this, this gap between two plates. If you look at a section through that, there's this, then there's an aperture between these two fractures, which we'll call lowercase b. And you've been using it, I think, in your assignments. Um, the fluid mechanics of this is that right at this wall, uh, the velocity is zero because the fluid molecule is attached to that wall and the bottom wall as well. And if you apply a pressure gradient between the upstream and downstream, so it's really not very different from what we did before. This is dp, this is dx. Then we can look at the flow that's driven along here. We don't really need to understand that. We can translate, we can get a solution for this, for flow between this simple geometry. Uh, we derived it if we went through it in 303. It takes two pages, we won't worry about it uh, here. And so what we could do is we could convert this 
flow distribution that's shown here. It's actually parabolic. It's a maximum flow velocity in the middle because it's not attached to these, to the B static at the edges. And if you plotted the um, flow velocity as an average flow velocity, then it would look like this. Average flow velocity has to be the same across the section. My only reason for drawing this little prism is that the area of this, as you look at it, should be the same as the area of this. All you're doing is you're changing this so that I guess it would look like this, right? You're cutting off this high part and you're stuffing it in here. It's kind of what you're doing. And if you do that, you get an expression which is this, written in terms of the head. But we could also write it in terms of the velocity. And I will write it in terms of velocity in that it would be, oops, velocity is equal to b squared over 12. So this is written in terms of heads. This is probably convenient to us to use. And 1 over viscosity. And so since this is really also the equivalent of k over mu dpdx, right? Darcy's law. This is the velocity. So the velocity is in meters per second. If we want to get the volumetric flow rate, we can just multiply by the area times the velocity. And so from this, I suppose you can see straight away that this term here is kind of the same as this. So we can write that the permeability of this system is equal to b, b squared over 12. Has the right units. We said that units of permeability are these strange units which are uh, the length, meters squared. It's actually also interesting in that we said before that the diameter of these little capillary tubes uh, is roughly equal, to that diameter squared is equal to the permeability. Here, this aperture of flow is equal to the permeability when it's squared. So this is units of meter squared. Has to be the same on the right-hand side. This is a characteristic dimension, which is the, the spacing between the plates of the fracture. And that's useful to us. So that's OK. So that's one way that we can write permeability, if you like, of a single fracture. But what if we wanted to write permeability for a porous medium? So permeability for fractured medium, I guess not a porous medium. And you, unbeknownst to yourselves, have already been wor working with this, right? You recognize this expression here. So all you, all you need to do, or think about it, is think about you have a fracture here. You know what that transmission characteristics for that fracture are. So if you have multiple fractures in a cross section, in a unit area, say a meter by a meter squared, uh, in this area here. I shouldn't have drawn it in black, should I? So in other words, if I draw this in perspective, just so that you understand what the uh, individual dimensions are. Then you have a fracture and these have these individual apertures. So this is the aperture of the fracture in each case. But the spacing between the fractures which is this distance here, from center to center of fractures. So th these fractures might be a millimeter 
thick. That'd be a, a thick fracture. This spacing might be a foot, 300 millimeters. So this spacing S is much larger than this. So it doesn't really matter if it's in the middle of the fracture or the edge of it. So the fracture uh, spacing is this. So the number of fractures per meter would be one over spacing. If you have a fracture every 0.5 meters, the number of fractures per meter is one over 0.5, which is two fractures per meter, which is what this is saying here. And so cutting to the chase, the permeability for a fractured medium is going to be um, b squared over 12 times the numbers of fractures per unit area, which is this, 1 over spacing, times the cross-sectional area that it flows through, which is b. And you've seen this equation before because you're playing around with it right now, I think. And that is that this term together is b cubed over 12s. And so if you wanted to, again, coming back to what we've talked about before, oops, I wanted to do this. And so if the cross-sectional area inside here uh, is equal to A, then Q would be equal to A K over mu dpdx, which is equal to A times b cubed over 12s, this term here. One over viscosity of whatever the fluid is times dp dx. So again, pretty straightforward. So the total area would be the you know one by one meter of the rock that contains these multiple fractures. And um, you could imagine that an extension of that without getting too mathematical about it is if you took a, the same kind of cross-section, I guess I could be fancy and I could copy the thing above, but I'm not going to do that. So if you had this system here that looked like this, so I'm just replicating what's up here. And if you can imagine that you had another set of f fractures, which wouldn't be uncommon, right? You've, if you've driven down 322 past the limestone uh, cuts that are just south of um, State College. Thank you. And these also happen to be B and S. Then you can imagine that the permeability would be equal to uh, B cubed over 12S, maybe call this 1 and 1, plus B cubed 2. over 12s2. Perhaps getting a bit too pedantic here, but you... No, sorry. This. Right? S2. So if you have one set of fractures, you get uh, this permeability is 1 over 12. If you have two sets of fractures, if these spacings and apertures were the same as first order, then this permeability, if you add those two together, would be just equal to b cubed over 6s, right? 1 plus 1 is 2 over 12. So, yeah. So, just playing some games. <laughs>
So um, this wouldn't be unusual. So, so what we've done is we've defined a capillary model that allows us to be able to define this permeability. Um, it might sound a bit esoteric to do that because you can't go into very many rocks and take a feeler gauge. Feeler gauge is what, I don't know if you use it anymore, it used to be what you put between the tip of a spark plug to get the spacing just right. So it'd be a couple of thicknesses of metal and you'd tap the spark plug just to get the separation right so the spark was just would fire right in your car. So you can't really do that. Um, but what we could do is we could do the opposite. For instance, if we know that permeability is equal to um, b cubed over 12s, then if we knew permeability, for instance, and certainly as you go down 322, and as you look at the uh, road cuts, you can certainly see what the spacing is between fractures, then potentially you can take this and you could rearrange it to get uh, aperture is equal to permeability, which you could measure by some in situ test, times 12 times the spacing, which you could measure just by looking at it. And you could take the cube root of that. This would be b cubed, so if you take the cube root, it'd be this, and you get rid of this term here. And so you'd have an aperture uh, for this, which, uh, why would you want that? Well, you might want it because we said that things like our capillary pressure, entry pressure, are a function of the diameters of the capillary pores or the, the aperture of the fractures, which is actually what you're doing with Yucca Mountain right now. And so this is where that comes from. So it seems strange to define it in terms of an aperture, but usually the use of that is to turn it backwards and figure out what the aperture is from a, an easy measurement to make, an in-situ measurement of permeability, and then use that to say something about how this, the system behaves. And you could imagine that for a fractured rock, you could think of the fractures just as capillary tubes. And since the porous media that we have are just like capillary tubes, there's no reason why the relative permeability curves for fractures might not work the same way. You could imagine that, um, for instance, if you zoomed in a fracture, if you looked at it, uh, if you zoomed in on this area here, you can imagine that a fracture might look like this. Some void spaces and some contacting points. And so if you stretch this along and look at what that might translate to, it doesn't take much of a stretch of the imagination that you could think of this as a tube, capri tube of some behavior. And so this behavior of this would just look like a collection of little capri tubes. And that's exactly what people do. They idealize it to get the behavior and understand processes for that. And so it's not too much of a stretch to believe that the relative permeability curves might look the same as um, they do for porous medium. They have these excluded zones because of the uh, residual saturations, um, the amount of water that you never remove from it, and the amount of the non-wetting fluid that you never remove from it. The fact that this non-wetting curve is higher because it preferentially fills the voids up first just as it did in the bead pack that we looked at, it's higher than this. And also, if you add these together to each other, you'd also end up with a curve that would be something like K N W plus K relative permeability, right? The relative permeability of the non-wetting fluid and the relative permeability to the wetting fluid when you add them together, they don't equal one. So, same as before. So that's the reason for doing that. So that's these these are so again this is a kind of continuation of a an important feel for these systems. Okay. So. So let's go. Uh, so so now. Um, I'm going to go back to something that I did on the 4th of February, 2021. And let's uh, look at this. This is a, a summary. Uh, 
take a picture of this or do whatever you need to do. It'll be recorded, of course. But this is kind of the next incarnation. So we talked about porous media. Uh, we said what the capillary pressure versus saturation curves would look like for that. Um, and we also said what the relative permeability curves would look like for those porous media. We've just visited a fracture. And we said that in the same way that we looked at a fracture as being placed within a cap, like a capri tube, right? Remember we made this height rise in a capri tube, height rise in a fracture. Um, we said something about the capri behavior of those. We've now just made the stretch that perhaps we can link the behaviors for the capri pressure versus saturation and the relative permeabilities to each other for both of those systems, fractures and porous media. Let's not worry about fractures for now, but let's work through it for a porous medium. For the porous medium, we said that if we stick a capri tube into some fluid, then the height rise that we get is given by this expression, right? Four times the interfacial tension divided by the, the diameter of the capillary. So this is the diameter multiplied by the unit weight of the fluid. So remember, it's the amount of fluid we can pull up by the surface tension acting on this rim here and the weight of the fluid that's dragging us down. If we multiply uh, this term here, both sides by unit weight, then we get rid of this term here, and we have the capillary pressure, by definition, is for, proportional to the interfacial tension and inversely proportional to the diameter. Um, so we have that. And we also, uh, we've mentioned this, we haven't derived it, but we just did this for the fracture. We said that the permeability of a fractured medium is the aperture cubed divided by 12 times the spacing. We can get an, an analogous equation for the permeability of, of a porous medium. <clears throat> we did mention it, uh, I think, perhaps last Thursday. And it's equal to the diameter of the capillary tubes. So in other words, uh, we think of a bundle of capillaries representing the porous medium. And these would each have some kind of diameter, which is equal to D. And it would have a porosity. The porosity is defined as the volume of voids divided by the total volume, or the area of voids divided by the total area. So it would be, if it's no pores in it at all, it would be 0. If it's 100% porous with no solids, it would be 1. And uh, 96. I think we said 32 the other day, but that's not quibble about that. 92 is a third of 96. And we can explain that later. So out of this then, we have this Capri pressure behavior, which says something about the height rise that we get in this system. And we said that the bubbling pressure is kind of analogous to the pressure we have to apply in one fluid to start pushing this non-wetting fluid into a water-filled medium. So that's exactly what this PC0 is. And so this would be this term here. We can also define the permeability of this porous medium in terms of this capillary equation, if you like. So these are two equations that we might need. We also define relative permeability as being just a, a number between 1 and 0 that allows us to scale the areas. And I suppose we have an effective permeability so that this don't need to write it there. I can write it here. But this box term here, I guess, would be a, an effective permeability. Right. So effective permeability is just the relative permeability, which is a function of a saturation, right? You come along to a sat given saturation, and then the relative permeability changes with that saturation. 
So that's all that. This means a function of. So it's a product of a relative permeability and the actual permeability of the, the porous medium, which is uh, Garrett's question from before. And so we can get, so these are all things that we know. So the only important thing about this is that we've talked about these Leverett curves, if you remember, and the fact that this bubbling pressure is always equal to a value of this J function, which is 0 0.3. So where the hell does that come from? It's very, very simple. If you take this Capri curve, which says the pressure that you have to push in a Capri to get to displace a fluid against surface tension, and if you take the permeability, which says something about the pressure gradient you have to move that fluid along in steady flow, if we take those two expressions and we see that they are related to each other because the diameter occurs in both of them, right? D occurs in each of these. And that's not surprising. The Capri models that are saying that the displacement characteristics of moving a fluid and transporting the fluid are related to the geometry of the, the pipes that make up that model. And so I can't get it all on one page so you can see it. But if you do this, so I'm going to take each of these two terms, which are these two terms here. The, the entry pressure is equal to four times the interfacial tension divided by D. The permeability is rated to d squared porosity over 96. Let's write each of these expressions in terms of d only, which are these two expressions. Right? Rearrange this in terms of d, rearrange this in terms of d, you get these two expressions. Equate them to each other, because the d's are the same. And if you do that, you get this expression here. It's so four times interfacial tension over PC, uh, permeability over porosity times 96. If you make this 96 100 and square root it and take it out of the bracket, you get this. And then if you divide both sides through by 1 over 10, this is equal to 1 then you get this. And if you note, um, this is the cap, this is not the bubbling pressure, but this, well, actually in this case it's the, the, the bubbling pressure, PC0, interfacial tension, permeability, and porosity. And so it gives a definitive number for this. Happens to be 0.4, uh, and before we used 0.3, And if you remember, I know you're busy writing that down, it'll be included in the video, of course. If you remember, if we go back to this, I don't need to give you whiplash. We talked about the Leverett J function. This, this is. So we didn't introduce it, but we had this curve. This is our capillary pressure versus saturation curve. 100% water saturated, 0% water saturated. This is the bubbling pressure that occurs here, and we could represent it by a not very distinct J function here, which if we write it out is uh, that the J function is equal to capillary pressure divided by interfacial tension, uh, permeability, divided by porosity, divided uh, square root. It's, it's up here, actually, isn't it? And this is a particular number. It occurs at 0.3. So this is the origin of that curve. And so it comes, really, if you, you step back from it, we describe the porous medium as a bunch of tubes put together, and we can define the invasion pressure of that, how much fluid pressure, overpressure we have to get, to push another fluid into it, the first part of our course. We can also define how much it takes to, in terms of the pressure gradient to um, continuously move that fluid along it through Darcy's law, 
And if we know what those two equations are defined for the same medium, we relate them to the same diameter, and we come up with the linking expression. And so that's a useful expression for us, because what it means, oh, my pen, is that we can link those two. So, so that's the origin for this. So if we go back to these curves, that's really what we're interested in. We can define this curve in terms of um, a capillary pressure, which is the difference between the wetting, non-wetting and the wetting fluids. Or we can define it in terms of a J function. And this J function is just equal to capillary pressure divided by interfacial tension, permeability, porosity, square root. Buckingham pi in real life action, right? This is a non-dimensional term. You can look at the different parameters of this. It's called the Leverett J function. This, from our calculations, was 0 0.4. We made some simplifications here, but this is basically that term. So, so the utility of that is that um, we can get a permeability quite easily. You can take a core back to the lab, do an experiment. You can do an in-situ flow test using size or thyme equations. You must have talked about those in 452. You can get a permeability. If we get a permeability, we'd like to know what the other multiphase flow characteristics are. And so we can get that quite easily because we know, we have no idea what this curve looks like in terms of how it gets anchored to a number. But if we know that um, the J function is equal to 0 0.3, which is equal to the bubbling pressure, which we don't usually know. Interfacial tension of the fluid we can get from a, a, um, a standard text. Permeability, well, we've said that we could probably measure that in, the, in situ. Porosity, we can probably measure that in situ as well. Porosity is probably either 0 0.1 or 0 0.3, 10 to 30 percent. And so now, if we know what these are, then we all of a sudden have a way of getting this. If we have a way of getting this, all of a sudden we've anchored this curve at this particular point. And this is the magnitude we have to get to say something about how the porous medium saturates. And so from that, we can construct the whole rest of this curve just by using this. This is roughly 10%. This is roughly 10% from these curves. Just order of magnitude. 10 to 15%, or if we write it in terms of uh, fractions, it's 0 0.1. And this is 0 0.1, which is this length here. And so if we anchor this point here, then we can actually construct these curves. I guess we don't know quite how steeply it rises. But actually, if you look at the Leverett curve, you do know how steeply it rises. It's a bit different. This isn't 10% here. This is a few percent, right? Probably 5%. This is 20, so this is probably 5%. But it gives you a way to at least construct this curve. So that's useful. And so I suppose the other thing that we've done, which we didn't really do right now, is that if we've gone through defining this capillary rise and the permeability in terms of these um, dimensions of the porous medium, the, the, the tube dimensions. We've also done the same for fractures. This is the height rise in a fracture. This is the permeability of fracture. We just spent a bit of time doing this today. Then if we do this for this system, um, then what would, what would you get? We would get, I can do it right here. What do we want to do? We want to write this in terms of B is equal to K times 12S. Cube root. Uh, 
can get rid of this, right? If we write this in terms of b, then b is equal to 2 times interfacial tension over the bubbling pressure. And so I suppose we could equate these to each other. And if we did that, we'd end up with 2 times interfacial tension over the capillary pressure is equal to cube root permeability times 12s. And I suppose if we wanted to rearrange that in terms of a non-dimensional property, we would get PC0 over 2 times interfacial tension So I've multiplied by permeability times 12 times spacing, cube root. And this is very, this is basically the J function for a, a fractured medium. So it's PC over sigma, which is this term here, multiplied by permeability 12 times spacing over 8. 2 cubed is 8, right? Just to get under the same bracket. So, so that, that represents this point, same point here. So it may seem a bit esoteric, but that's really all that we've tried to do. So, so this, I think this, this page is important. It talks about porous media, it talks about fractured media. Uh, it talks about understanding these curves is important to understand, and we've kind of explained that. But they do sit on top of each other. The exclusion zones for each are the same exclusion zones, and that they allow us to say something about, if we know what this point is here, then I suppose the other um, slide we can go back to is this one here. Right? I think this is a, an important slide for us as well. Right? So if we want to know exactly what the distributions of saturation in the subsurface are, it all revolves around this capillary pressure versus saturation curve. So, so it, it allows us to say something quantitative about our porous medium. So I'm probably talking about too much this time. So the last bit to take care of, um, which you won't use in this class, but I guess it might be useful to, to know a bit about in, over, in overview, uh, still this, is how we get fluids flowing together in one system. And I will try and explain this. this. So, so that's the, the, the next topic. So imagine that we have so this is our tube that we'd drawn as a, a core before. And this is right hand rule. Uh, yeah, this is why we talk about this in that class. This be x, y, z. Remember, right? Uh, right hand rule. And for our purposes here, this would be. This would be this. 
I'm becoming quite the artiste. And this would be Q non-wedding and Q lowercase Q wedding. So what we could do, uh, again, you'll never need to know this in this class because it's be but I'm just putting it in perspective. We could write a conservation of mass equation and it would look in differential format like this. Rate of change of velocity in the x direction dx plus rate of change of let me write rate of change of velocity in the x direction plus rate of change of velocity in the y direction plus rate of change of velocity in the z direction plus mass flow rate, mass accumulation rate equals zero. Remember? So we wrote um, density, velocity, area, plus rate of accumulation equals zero. You might remember that expression, conservation of mass. Um, I don't know, weeks, six, can't remember, it doesn't matter. This is conservation of mass. And this is accumulation. This is mass in minus mass out. Apologize for my bad handwriting. So you look at how much goes in, how much goes out. If they don't balance each other, then it has to accumulate. That's really all it's saying. It's filling up a bucket uh, from the difference in what goes out versus goes in. This expression is exactly the same. This is accumulation. And this is mass in minus mass out. Mass rates, actually. Q is a velocity, so velocity divided by a length is a length over time divided by a length, which is interesting units, which is 1 over seconds. So the units of this are 1 over seconds. So this would be a mass rate per unit mass. Mass rate per unit mass is mass per second divided by mass, which is one over seconds. So this is really, um, so I suppose you could think about dqx dx being equal to a velocity times an area. So the area would be dx times dz in this case, divided by dx dy, dz. Right? The volume of this is, I think I'm talking too much and being too esoteric about this. Right? Remember we defined the volumes as this little differential cube. So the rate of change of velocity over the length of, over which it flows is equal to a velocity So this is a velocity. Area divided by these. Obviously, in this particular case, the area is equal to dy dx. Right? So this term cancels out. This term cancels out. And you're left with the velocity over this. Now, too, too much information. So the point is that this continuity equation, since we know from Darcy's law that Q is equal to 
a relative perm times a permeability divided by a viscosity times a pressure gradient. Then we could imagine that this term here could go in here or it could go in to, whoops, into this expression here. So, too, too complicated. So we could write this continuity term to represent two cases, the stuff coming in and the stuff going out. What doesn't, what doesn't balance has to accumulate. And the accumulation will be that the volume of this red fluid will increase relative to the green fluid if it accumulates because it has to push out more of the green fluid to do that. And so the continuity equation to describe this process of mass in minus mass out being equal to accumulation is this, this term here. This is the mass rate in minus the mass rate out. Uh, it's, it's multiplied both sides by densities because we can, if we, if we have to do mass balance, not volume balance. And this is the Darcy's law term that we could substitute. This is the accumulation term. The rate of change with time of the saturation times the porosity, this would be, this term here would just be what? Porosity times the saturation would be the volume of fluid alpha. Volume times density is equal to, together these are the mass, the mass of fluid alpha of whatever fluid alpha. That's what that is. This term here is, is the amount of fluid that's coming in. If we substitute for Darcy's law into this, then we can do this for two equations. We'll have one equation for the red fluid. So the red fluid would be alpha equals one. The green fluid would be for alpha equals two, which is our non-wetting fluid, which is our wetting fluid, I think. So water, one, and the wetting fluid, etc. And so what we would do is we would write one of these equations for each of these phases. That's all. So you'd have one equation for alpha equals one, and one equation for alpha equals two. And so the punchline is, um, we're, we're already entrenched too deeply in this, I think, is that we want to be able to solve this equation for this flow regime. So we can write an equation for the red fluid, which looks like this, and we can write an equation for the green fluid, which looks like this, and we get these two equations below, just by substituting for the porosity of the medium, which is constant, the saturation of fluid one, and the density of fluid one, the density of fluid one, and the flow velocity of fluid one. So that's one equation. And the saturation of the porous medium, which is constant, and this, sorry, the, the porosity of fluid one of the medium, which is constant, and the saturation of, and the density of the other fluid, which is different. So these equations give us these two equations one for the red fluid, one for the green fluid. We've substituted in for Darcy's law here, which gives us this big term here. I guess that would be a red one, really. This is Darcy's law in here. And this is Darcy's law in here. And the final important thing to realize is if we look at the individual terms that describe this behavior. We have a pressure for fluid one, we have a pressure for fluid two, and we have a saturation for fluid one and a saturation for fluid two. Those are what are coming out of these individual equ equations. So this comes from here, I guess, right? This would be this. But we only have two equations. And so we don't have enough to be able to solve it.
So we have to look for some other things we know about it to be able to solve it. So what else do we know? We know that the saturations of the two fluids have to sum to one. And this is just saying that in terms of these red and green prisms, if the red prism grows, the green one has to shrink to accommodate it because they have to add up to one. That's all that's saying. And we know that the difference in pressures between the two fluids has to equal our definition of capillary pressure. And so the difference between those pressures is actually this difference here. The pressure of the water would be this one here. The pressure of the non-wetting fluid would be this. And I guess by definition, this would be the capillary pressure, the difference between them. And we know that this is a function of saturation because this curve that we've looked at, if we draw it, looks like this. This is saturation of water. This is zero. This is one. And the curve looks like this. And so this, as we change the magnitude of this saturation and go along here, then we go along this curve. And so definitely the magnitude of capillary pressure is a function of this saturation. When the saturation of water is equal to this, then the capillary pressure difference has to be this magnitude. So that kind of closes the equation. So we don't care about that particularly. But the point is that we've taken big picture. Don't worry about the details. We've written a control volume. We filled it with two fluids. We've defined separate control volumes within that that abut against each other. And as one control volume shrinks, the other one grows because the saturations have to be the same. We can write the mass rate in versus the mass rate out. And the difference between those has to be an accumulation. That accumulation is manifest by the changing of the proportions of the phases. And we can describe that in terms of this uh, mass conservation equation that we've talked about before. So there's reason of why we, we talk about those things. You don't need to understand it particularly here. But know that if we have these four constraints, we can solve a multiphase flow equation. And the solution of that multiphase flow equation would be something that would be this. I don't need to talk about it. Uh, and would, be, would result in this behavior here. So the idea is you take um, a reservoir, which is this region here. So the reservoir is this. And Darcy's law really only provides our behavior in a little piece of core. If that core is really long, then the distribution of pressures, the gradients along the length of it, might change quite a lot as you go from the inlet to the outlet. So what we could do is we could look at flowing water into that core and seeing exactly how the saturations would change as we go along it. So you could imagine that we would start off, if it was an oil-filled core that it would look like it had some saturation. And people are going to want to come in here because we're right up against time. And as you push this other fluid along the length of this core, we'll start with this next time, what you'll do is you'll progressively push a tongue of this fluid along the length of it, and so you completely permeate along the core. And so let's not say anything more about that. We'll start off with that connection next time. So I would say that in what we've talked about today, the most important figures that we've talked about are this, in that these sit on top of each other. Relative permeability is say how quickly the fluid moves along as it, fill, as it doesn't change the saturation of the pore space. And the capillary pressure versus saturation curves say how the behavior occurs as you change the saturations and you do that by changing the relative pressures in those two fluids. So that's it. That's it. Sorry, didn't run right, mean to run right out to the left.